So we got a special treat for you. We're going to be looking at a classical pawn structure in chess, the hanging pawns, and we're going to look at two games. And the first game is going to be following our great game series with Karpov, and he so efficiently puts away Korchnoi that he makes the hanging pawns, which most people look at as a disadvantage, into advantage. And in the second game, we're not going to tell you the ratings of the players playing. But if you can guess in the comments, we'll send you a free book. Okay. Nobody in this room can comment. I'll know it's you. Cheaters. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, we get a typical Queen's Gambit structure. And notice this move order. This is one of uh, Karpov's specialties. He didn't want to play knight f6 first because you have to face the exchange variation. If you play bishop e7 first, there is no exchange. So that's a minor finesse. Now he plays knight f6 because with the knight committed to f3, the exchange variation isn't as strong like the way we taught you to play it with the knight e2, which is seen in the d4 repertoire video. Kasparov's version of the exchange. So bishop g5. And a line that got some popularity was with bishop takes and rook c1. And this type of position, it's got just a slight amount of pull for a moment. And then once we get to right here, I'm pretty sure this bishop takes line played in this way is busted. Because black has full equality in the bishop pair in an open position. This looks like a game where it went a little off for white because he didn't get what he wanted, and now he's going to get busted. Keanu is on his way. Oh, Laughlin, uh, he is currently not with me. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. Uh-huh. Okay, I use first name, so I should be okay there. Ish. Now, coming back to the main game. Bishop h4. Castles, e3. And this is one of those things I wanted to show for my Queen's Gambit players. I've been liking investigating these types of moves like g4. But it's interesting what the computer recommended here. It allows g5, so you can play knight e4 and work the pin on the bishop. That's, that's a nice little in-between move that I didn't expect. And now, tickle. And it looks like he's getting a little something, but after knight e5, freaking exclaim. Check. Pins and stuff. Ah, oh, so nice. Knight takes. And this is good too, because queen takes, knight f3, knight takes g1, <laughs> and you got a draw. <laughs> so, pretty ridiculous game there with, with the whole g4. I just really like that, so I wanted to throw that in there as a bonus. So, b6, we got rook c1. And. After takes, takes, get c5, and we have our classical hanging pawn structure. Now it's time for the clinic and how to play this position for black. Most players won't touch this position. Most modern players try to avoid this like the plague, but if you know what you're doing, like uh, Karpov or when that one guy you might remember, Sergei Karyakin, who got his shot at Magnus for the world title. Yeah, there's a nice game in the database where he beats Nakamura from a hanging pawns position in the candidates tournament to get a full point with black in order to you know pave that way to facing Magnus. Pretty critical. Only a handful of guys can play these really well. So queen c2, lining up the rook. Queen b6. And after 
Rook F D eight. This next move is critical in the structure to remember. Queen E six. Now notice with the queen there, it's unnatural, right? It gets the queen out of the way of the rooks. And at the same time, it's going to be eyeing key squares after different pawn pushes. And it's not easy to try to kick the queen out of this square. It's got the utmost flexibility. Black's position is ready. If you push these pawns too quickly without being critical, you'll be dead lost. So it's very important to be patient here. So for instance, if white would have played rook cd2, this kind of patient waiting until white plays e4 and forces you, this was, I believe, slightly better for white when I analyzed the position. So queen e6 was played, bishop g3, and this was the point in the game where Karpov be began to get a little something. And it's amazing. This looks like an equal position, but this is what a player like Karpov thrives in. Grab. He's just slowly improving. Don't take my ape on. Improving the king. Now coming back the other way, thinking about d4. Making d4 the dream. Now right here, white's pretty much got to play takes. And then this position was uh, pretty nice. Hitting the queen. So after d4, knight e2 was played. Pieces are coming alive. Not in too much of a hurry, queen e5. And when I was analyzing, I analyzed quite a few of Karpov's games when I was choosing games for the series. And this is one of those things that I noticed time and time again. When I was analyzing Fisher's games, when it's a critical moment like this, where there's this deep tactic that would make the position really messy, it may be winning. Fisher would go for it and win the game because he's razor sharp. Karpov will more than likely see that but go, eh, that's pretty messy. So then he chooses a move which just squeezes that much more, which I talked about in a different lesson, the concept of Karpov's style being like a boa constrictor. It's just... He's going to keep turning the screw on the weaknesses that you have, making you contort yourself to try to defend everything, and only then is he going to break you. So here, rook takes d4 does work in the position with queen takes g3, and this is messy. But Karpov here simply plays queen e5, hitting multiple weaknesses, just turning that screw tighter. So king h1. And again, another, another solid, quiet move. Now we take the pawn. Didn't want to trade off the last rook. Wants our knight closer to uh, doing tactical stuff. Nice. Check. Knight's on a better square. Such coordination. <laughs> it's All the pieces just keep working together. Rook takes. He's not worried about anything. And again, this is one of those situations. G5 leads to mate. Karpov simply goes queen d6 going, do you want to trade queen so you have no chance whatsoever? No. Well, I'll check you. And then go queen d6 and threaten it again. And now after rook b5, the rook's coming over. And fortunately, had enough. Did it look like, I mean, there were tactical ways that black could win. But I think from a practical standpoint, Karpov played very, very well. 
in the sense that he allowed no counterplay at any point in time while continually just slowly improving his position. I do not care what the computer evaluation says. If your technique wins the game, we're beating humans, not computers. And especially your generation, you're growing up using nothing but computers to analyze, and you believe what they offer is truth in all situations. Now it's great because we're seeing all these players that are growing up in areas of the world, especially in India, there are so many young, strong Indian players, I, IMs and GMs, just like, they're just being grown there from tactical chops and using the computer. But the drawback with this is they'll look at a beautiful game like this and be like, well, Karpov played inaccurately. He could have just won tactically like this. When does style come into how you problem solve? If I see that I can win the game tactically, but I have a chance of missing something and blundering and losing on the spot, versus I know I can play this move and I'm 100% a little bit better than I was on the previous move and I'm not losing with no chance to lose and I'm going to keep mounting pressure, what sounds easier to play? The second one. So keep this in mind in your games. You don't always have to have flashy wins. Well, I mean, come on, do better. But sometimes the clean win, it just feels nice when your opponent had no chance. Now, let's take a look at one of these student games that uses the hanging pawns. And uh, the butthole needs to be paying attention to this one from the white side. Mm-hmm. Check. And we love this stutter step. I have this in, in my notes for my students who play the Queen's Gambit because in many variations of the Catalan, this bishop wants to go on B2. With this line, we completely prevent the idea of the bishop going to B2 unless he wants to waste many tempi. The knight can't go to D2, C3 in these variations. It's just annoying. Castle, castle, B6. It's funny, the Lee Chess evaluation is saying that that's an inaccuracy. Uh, C6 is actually inferior. The computer just doesn't understand it because the way you played it with B6 and C5 straight away, if you played C6, you're going to have to stutter step and play C5 later. So you're actually wasting a full move with the computer's plan. So the Lee Chess evaluation engine, meh. Okay, Knight C3. Knight BD7, and right here was that point, because I told you when I was analyzing this game that uh, I was struggling to find an improvement. Now, in the game, Knight E5 was played, and it's a logical move, but getting back to our preparation with white, Bishop F4, and one, it encourages D takes C4, and you should leave the complications. And after bishop b7, now we take and go queen a4, and white has some steady pressure here. After c5, rook fd1. And now you couldn't get the hanging pawns because the rook was hitting the d-pawn. And like I said, white's got some slight pull. It's not much, but white's clearly better here. So bishop f4 was the right way to go. Knight e5, and he gets to a similar position, but with the knight on e5, it makes it a little different because c5 packs more of a punch because the knight isn't on f3, holding down key squares. And once this trade happens, I and the computer both agree that black's slightly better. You're fully developed. You've connected your rooks, your queen's on a decent square, and you're attacking. Your bishop, which is typically a liability on b7, is defended. You're better. Takes, 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 takes. Rook c1. And you found the right moment to play d4. You defend that weak pawn. Knight's flexible. It's hitting the bishop on f4, so he defends it and adds more pressure. b3. And now after knight b6, 
your pawn is weak no more, your pawn structure is better, you've outplayed your opponent. B4. Rook FD8. And it likes Queen A6, but Rook FD8 is logical. Queen D7. Nice in between move. After rook h5, it's classy. He's got to try to defend somehow. G4. When you got to play a move like that, you know it's getting bad. And your opponent was probably in like wicked time pressure here, right? B4, I mean, rook h g5, they're saying, is uh, the beast move. But b4 looks pretty nice too because. It says all of your heavies are on the B file. Let's keep them that way. So queen d2. And most of this was you using the fact that your opponent was in time pressure. You weren't like playing hypercritical moves. Your opponent, of course, drops the rook and he'd had enough. But quality game. The hanging pawns, and I, I felt it should be included in that uh, Karpov game just because it's it's instructive, and like I said, a lot of players are very intimidated by the hanging pawns. You definitely should not be.